2 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, today, I'm going to be taking things in a bit of a different direction than usual to something about this passage that you don't see on the surface, but when you read about one of the same events in Chronicles and compare them, it's something that might really strike you as hard to swallow. And so I'm going to take some time to go through that first, and then after that we'll quickly go over the theme of this passage. So stick with me through the first part because it might be a little bit much to take in all at once, but I, I just want to go through it so that if you ever encounter this stuff, uh, your faith doesn't get shaken. So first we'll read this entire chapter, then I'll pray, and then we'll get into it. So 2 Samuel chapter 8. After this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them, and David took Metheg Ammon out of the hands of the Philistines. And he defeated Moab, and he measured them with a line, making them lie down on the ground. Two lines he measured to be put to death, and one line to be spared. And the Moabites became servants to David and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rahab, king of Zobah, as he went to restore his power at the river Euphrates. And David took from him 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers. And David hamstrung all the chariot horses, but left enough for 100 chariots. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king, king of Zobah, David struck down 22,000 men of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Aram of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought tribute. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. And David took the shields of gold that were carried by the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Beda and from Berothai, cities of Hadadezer, King David took very much bronze. When Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated the whole army of Hadadezer, Toi sent his son Joram to King David to ask about his health and to bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him. For Hadadezer had often been at war with Toi, and Joram brought with him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. These also King David dedicated to the Lord together with the silver and gold that he dedicated from all the nations he subdued, from Edom, Moab, the Ammonites, the Philistines, Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David made a name for himself when he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. Then he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became David's servants. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and equity to all his people. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the army, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. And Zadok, the son of Ahitab, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were priests. And Sariah was secretary, and Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And David's sons were priests. God, as we dig into this uh, passage and dig into um, the little detail as well that we're really going to look at, I just pray that you would be with me as I speak, that you would be with all of us, giving us understanding of your word, giving us uh, just hearts that, that, that trust you, and yeah, just be at work in all of our hearts in the name of Jesus. Be with me as I speak. If I say anything that's wrong or untrue, I just pray that that would not be believed in the name of Jesus. I just pray that your truths would be believed, and your truths would be remembered in the name of Jesus, that your truths would affect us, Lord. And so I pray for each one of us that you would be at work in this time, in this place, through this message, and that you would be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Are there any contradictions in the Bible? For some of us, that thought might seem really silly. You know, maybe we've heard people say that in two of the four Gospels, there's only one angel at Jesus' empty tomb, 
And in the other two Gospels, there are two angels. But if you read the text of Matthew and Mark, it never says there's only one angel. There's an angel that descends, that, that rolls away the stone, and that talks to the woman about how Jesus is no longer there. But in Luke and John, there's more than just one angel. John specifically tells us that there are two. Now, just because Matthew and Mark didn't mention that, doesn't mean the other angel wasn't there, right? It's just that Luke and John give us that extra bit of information that Matthew and Mark don't. Most things in the Bible that some people would call contradictions are easily explainable like that. But there are definitely some that are much more difficult, especially when you see one event in a book of a Bible, in a book of the Bible that, that you know, says a specific number, for instance, and then you look at that same event in a different book, and then there's a different number there. Most of the events that we read about in the books of Samuel and Kings are also told in the books of the Chronicles. For instance, in 1 Kings 7 and 2 Chronicles 4, we are given details about Solomon building the temple of the Lord. And in those details, we see that he has something called a sea of cast metal built. In the ESV Study Bible, we have an amazing illustration of Solomon's temple. And if we zoom in, we have that sea of cast metal. It's this giant kind of cauldron-looking basin that the priests use. Uh, they used it for washing. Now, when we read about how much this thing can hold, we seem to get a couple of different numbers. 1 Kings 7.26 says, Its thickness was a handbreadth. And its brim was made like the brim of a cup, like the flower of a lily. It held 2,000 baths. So it held 2,000 baths. Now, baths are a measurement, so it's like we would have liters, right? One bath was about 22 liters, or, or six gallons. So this basin, it was pretty big. It could hold up to 3,000 baths. But wait, didn't it just say 2,000? Let's look at 2 Chronicles 4, verse 5. Its thickness was a handbreadth, and its brim was made like the brim of a cup, like the flower of a lily. It held 3,000 baths. That's pretty strange, right? 2,000 is very different than 3,000. Now, I'm going to bring up something that may be a little bit difficult to swallow, and to do so, I'm going to bring up the first point of Wassa Community Church's statement of faith. It says, we believe that the Bible was given by divine inspiration and is the infallible word of God and without error in the original writings. It constitutes the only perfect rule and final authority in all matters of Christian faith and doctrine. So we believe that the Bible is inerrant, which is a word that means without error. The Bible doesn't have any errors, but notice these words. In the original writings. The Bible is without error in the original writings, the original manuscripts, the, the ones that were actually written by Moses or David or Jeremiah. We don't have those original writings. We don't have the actual pages that they themselves wrote on. They could be lost, they could be dust, they could be decomposed, they could be burnt. They could have been stained. All sorts of things could have happened to them. The manuscripts that we have are copies, right? What we've found to have been preserved to this day are copies of what was originally written. Now, we won't get too in-depth with this, but Jewish scribes were the strictest of the strict when it came to copying the scriptures. However, even with the best of the best, with the most perfect human copies, over thousands of years, you can expect a few tiny details like a number uh, to be mistakenly copied over because the numbers they had, they weren't written the same way as us. Like they weren't written the same way as we did, like as we do, like nine or uh, like, let's say nine or eight, right? They're not written like that. They're written out in Hebrew letters. And the difference between them can be almost nothing. Uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of Hebrew numbers here. This is a thousand, 
and this is 2,000. I'm not sure if you can see the difference there, but there, there is a difference. The dots and dashes yeah. are the difference. It's a very small difference, right? And, and that in itself, it might not be difficult for a copyist to mistake those two things. But that's not the actual problem. The problem that is key to note here is the pronunciation. You see those dots and dashes, they show us how a word is to be pronounced. But originally, Hebrew didn't have that. The ancient Hebrew language didn't have that. Back in the days of these Old Testament books being written, that word would have actually been this. It would have looked just like this. Can you tell if that's 1,000 or 2,000? No. Because the only way you can tell the difference between 1,000 and 2,000 in Hebrew is by the way it's pronounced. So without that, you have what on paper is the exact same word. Now, a lot of this stuff in Hebrew, you can, of course, get around. You know, it's like how the word read and the word read can be spelled the same way in English. But in context, you can figure out which one is meant to be said, right? So I'm sure in the same way, in most cases, if you know Hebrew, you can figure out what is meant through context. But in this case, it's a lot, hard, it's a lot harder because it's a number. And if you do the math and, and crunch the numbers, which I haven't, I'm not very good at math, I've just looked up what others have done. You can fit both 1,000 and 2,000 into the dimensions of the sea of cast metal that Solomon built. There's even a way to fit in 3,000. So yeah, the context, it won't tell you the difference between 1,000 and 2,000. Now, the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of, Old Testament, of the Old Testament, and that's from around 200 years before Jesus, in their Greek, they actually write 2,000 here. And so, for some reason, that's how it was seen back then. Perhaps because 1,000 baths may have seemed too small an amount to, to put in that large of a basin. Uh, I'm not really sure, but could be that. Um, but that's what they went with in this passage, is 2,000, which may have had an influence on why, when they started adding those dots and dashes for how a word is to be pronounced hundreds of years, hundreds of years later, they made the pronunciation to be 2,000, um, because context is not going to help them in that way. Um, but then we look at Chronicles, and, and we see something completely different, right? It says 3,000. That's neither, that's neither 1,000 or 2,000. Well, in Chronicles, there's actually an extra word there that indicates that it's definitely 3,000, and this is how it looks. So you see we have the same word there that means thousand. But the other word means three. So you put them together, it says 3,000. We don't have that in the book of Kings. And the thing is, when these original manuscripts are being copied and they pass through generations, we don't know what kind of wear and tear they go through, right? Pages get easily wrecked, fragments may get lost. Maybe this word, mean, that, this word that means three, maybe it was originally in the book of Kings, but the paper got, you know, perhaps eaten through a bit by worms or was damaged by water or something. There are a lot of possibilities. And whoever made a copy may have seen that. They may have seen that something was missing, but they didn't make any guess to what may have been there, only copying down the word thousand that they saw and went from there. So that's a possibility. This is why we say that the Bible is without error in the original writings, because there may have been a few tiny details where the copyist may have made a mistake. But those details are very, very small. Most of them are just spelling mistakes, actually, uh, but you will, the odd time, again, get these mistakes in the numbers. But you're never going to have the core beliefs or the core teachings affected by anything like this, right? The big ideas of Scripture, they're not affected by this. It's just those tiny details that may be. However, even if, even if this passage is something that suffers from a tiny mistake like that, that actually doesn't even mean it's wrong. We know 3,000 is the right number because of the extra word three in Chronicles. And so, if the sea of cast metal held 3,000 baths, it also, of course, held 
2,000 bats, right? If it held 3,000, 2,000 is a part of that. In fact, there are those who think, by the way that it's written in the Hebrew, that they only filled it up with 2,000 baths of water, even though it could hold 3,000. And that there's no mistake in any copying of this verse at all, because the author of Kings was talking about how much they actually filled it up with, and the author of Chronicles was talking about how much could actually fit in there if they filled it up the whole way. That's a legitimate solution to this problem. So if this is the result of a copyist error, that doesn't make it wrong. And if it's not the result of a copyist error, then the original writers just meant different things. Now, in a couple of chapters, we're going to come across another event where David, or sorry, where the number is different than it is in Chronicles, where the number in 2 Samuel is different than it is in Chronicles. And so this is it. 2 Samuel 10.18 tells us that David killed of the Syrians the men of 700 chariots, and 1 Chronicles 19.18 tells us that David killed of the Syrians the men of 7,000 chariots. With one saying 700 and the other saying 7,000, you can probably make the same conclusion as we did before. Something may have happened to a manuscript, perhaps a copyist made a mistake, but if it's true that the men of 7,000 chariots were killed, that includes 700, just like 3,000 baths includes 2,000. And so it's not untrue that those 700 chariots, those on 700 chariots were killed. It's just that you don't get the full picture until you get to Chronicles. There are, again, other solutions to this, right? Such as these being grouped into 10. And so the 700 represents the leaders or the captains over their group of 10. So Samuel would be mentioning the 700 captains and Chronicles would be mentioning the men of all 7,000 chariots. I'm not so sure about that one, but again, you know, God is beyond me and maybe that is the case. Then, finally, we have today's passage. Uh, we see David take down the Philistines. We see David take down Moab. We see David take down Hadadezer, the king of Zobah, and his men. And then when the Syrians come to help him, we see David take them down too. But in this, we get differing numbers of how many ha uh, of Hadadezer's horsemen David actually captures. So if I look at 2 Samuel 8, verses 3 to 4, if I look at 2 Samuel verse 8, 3 to 4, or chapter 8, verse 3 to 4, this is what I read. David also defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rahab, king of Zobah, as he went to restore his power at the river Euphrates. And David took from him 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers. So interestingly enough, if you actually have the King James Version, you're, you're already able to see a different number here. In my ESV, it says 1,700 horsemen. In the King James, it actually says 700. It actually separates the chariots from the horsemen. It says 1,000 chariots and 700 horsemen. The ESV just groups that all together. It says, okay, 1,700. Probably because it's very heavily based off of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And like many words in the Dead Sea Scrolls, because of age and deterioration, the word chariots is actually missing. So they likely put 1,700 together because the word that would have been in between them, chariots, is missing. But again, that's not the big issue. That's not the big issue. The issue comes from, again, when we look at 1 Chronicles. And uh, this is 1 Chronicles 18, verse 3 and 4. And that says, David also defeated Hadadezer, king of Zobah, Hamath, as he went to set up his monument at the river Euphrates. And David took from him 1,000 chariots, 7,000 horsemen, and 20,000 foot soldiers. So again, this ends up being another, is it 700 or 7,000 question. This time though, the Septuagint, that, that old Greek translation from before Jesus, helps us out a little bit. The Septuagint has both of these passages saying 1,000 chariots and 7,000 horsemen, which means the right number is very likely 7,000. And again, 
700 fits into 7,000. So it's not wrong that David captured 700 of Hadadezer's horsemen. It's actually also not wrong that he captured 1,700. It's just that that's not all that he captured. He captured 7,000 in total. So in these three examples, we see that even though there may be an error that happened during the copying process of the Bible, that still doesn't mean there's any contradiction. That still doesn't mean there's any contradiction. Now, don't let me make you think that these are the most difficult things that you'll come across in the Bible. There are more challenging areas in the Bible that I still need to put more study toward, and maybe one day in the future I'll be able to bring you a good explanation about them. But I wanted to take a deep dive into the numerical issue in this passage to show you, hey, this kind of thing, it should not shake your faith in God's Word. Now, I've spent a, a lot of time talking about one number that, that comes up in this passage. Uh, what about the rest of the passage? What's this all about? What is 2 Samuel chapter 8 all about? Well, we mentioned earlier that uh, David defeated the Philistines, the Moabites, the men of Zobah and the Syrians, Later on in verses 13 and 14, we see him also defeat Edom in one of those classic people of Jacob versus people of Esau conflicts. But one thing that rings true in this passage, something that's mentioned twice in the chapter, are the words at the end of both verse 6 and verse 14. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. The Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. Where did all those victories come from? They came from the Lord himself, God Almighty, Lord of all. Now, we do get this other part, too, in the story, and that'll be verses 8 and 9, or 9 and 10, sorry. And they tell us, when Toy, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated the whole army of Hadadezer, Toy sent his son Joram to King David to ask about his health and to bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him. For Hadadezer had often been at war with Toy, and Joram brought with him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. So Toy, the king of Hamath, a place that was even further north than Damascus, which is north of Israel already, he brings, or he sends his son, Joram, to bless David, which is awesome. David had, had defeated uh, an enemy of Toy, which is Hadadezer, the one from whom David captured those 7,000 horsemen. And so this king is very pleased with that. And that's why he sends Joram to bless David. That's a really awesome thing that's really nice to hear. But, of course, no blessing of man can compare with the blessings of God. And David knows this. So even after Joram brings him all these riches, verses 11 and 12 tell us this, these also King David dedicated to the Lord. These also King David dedicated to the Lord, together with the silver and gold that he dedicated from all the nations he subdued, from Edom, Moab, the Ammonites, the Philistines, Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rahab, king of Zobah. What the Lord blesses David with, David dedicates to the Lord. These victories, these blessings, these, these spoils, Without God, they're not his. And so instead of lifting himself up or something like that for winning these victories and taking these spoils, he lifts up the God who was behind his victories. God has blessed us immensely. Maybe with different things. Some, some may have you know, these great talents, some extra money, some different insights on life. All sorts of things, right? God's given us so much blessing. I just want to encourage you this morning to use those blessings for the Lord's sake. I was listening to Alistair Begg talking about this passage, and he says, or he said, Has Christ not won 
a great victory over sin and death, over shame, over guilt in your life, then bring all the spoils of his victory, your gifts, your abilities, your capacities, your usefulness, in the service of the king. Christ was crucified for you. He gave up his perfect life for your sinful one. He paid the ultimate price to purchase the greatest blessing imaginable for you, which is eternal life in his heavenly presence. If you accept that gift through placing your faith in him, you will receive it. You'll be saved from hell. You'll be forgiven of your sin. He has brought you victory over death. Death is defeated before you. It's been defeated by Jesus. Dedicate those spoils to the Lord. Use the blessings you've been given to serve the Lord. Bow with me in prayer. God, I thank you so, so much for the blessings that you give us, especially the blessing of eternal life, salvation through your Son, Jesus. The ultimate, ultimate blessing. And we had nothing to, to give to deserve that. And uh, I just thank you so much that you gave us that, Lord. And there are other blessings that you've given us, different gifts that we have, abilities that we can bless people with, all these different things. And I just pray that you would help us to use those for your sake, that those would be dedicated to you, to be used by you, and for you, God. So thank you again for your goodness, and uh, yeah, just... Be with each one of us. Continue to increase our faith. Continue to help us to love and look to your word for, for guidance in, in all things in life. And to look at it as your truth given to us, as your words to us for living even in today's world. It's not just some old book for old times and old problems. It's a book for today as well. And so I just pray that you would help increase our faith and help us to continue to look at your word to guide our lives and that we would lean on you as we live our lives as well because all this stuff, you know, we can say all this stuff about I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Lord, we're weak and so we need you as well. So help us to lean upon you in our lives as well. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen.